Good evening, everyone. My name is Elizabeth, the Education Coordinator for Marlene's Market and Deli. Tonight's special guest that we have with us is Dr. Tim Sobe, a physical therapist, and he's speaking on the topic of your eyes made for not are made for being and not just for seeing. Thank you so much, Dr. Sobe, for joining us. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. I think just to review, I'll just go ahead and read the um, the description of what you know, I submitted for your catalog, Elizabeth. And I'd like each person in the audience or attending just to sort of uh, hear what you read and why you're here. And then I'll just ask a couple questions as to what brought you here. So eyes, your eyes, as spherical shaped objects, these paired light gathering entities constitute themselves indeed as orbital essentials, like an orbit, yeah? and through which all our inner and outer perceptions, spatial orientations, and navigational journeys are made. So like the uh, back of a book, you know, if you're reading the book in the store, you know. Uh, so this experiential retreat workshop, which we'll be moving towards soon, uh, gives you an overview, informative overview. And by the word informative, I mean forming from within, um, how the eyes can constellate the entire body in coordinated movement, uh, come to, understand that the eyes, body, balance, equilibrium, emotional states, effective thinking, enhanced quality of being, that's all intertwined. And it's just interesting to note too that, you know, as infant development in utero, uh, we're, we're in a blind environment, basically. It's all dark in utero, in the womb. And our eyes are very much closed when we're born, mostly, not, not all the time, but it's like, sort of um, a background sense that's incubating. And we enter the world as this relationship of handling and seeing objects in the world and spatial representation with ourselves that somehow with maturation, our eyes become the dominant sense of our sensory representation and um, ways of uh, navigating the world. So it's an interesting journey in itself that way. So. You know, first of all, I just mentioned it in the chat or just uh, abstain from that either way. Uh, I could just inquire about how many persons are interested in maybe eyes from just a strictly visual optim optometric uh, type of perspective. Like uh, there's eye health, there's eye nutrition. I know Elizabeth, they asked for that. I really don't have that background. It's more of a naturopathic version. But Maybe you can just mention in chat or just raise your hand. How many are here thinking it's about eyes only, independent of everything else? I'm and, on a iPad, so I don't know how to raise my hand or chat because um, I'm new to that. So I'm just going to talk. So mm -hmm. I'm a naturopathic physician specializing in mental health. And what I have found is that the eyes often reveal that people have had TBIs a traumatic mm -hmm. brain injuries and um and that is causing a lot of fatigue and frustration and then causing mental health and so um mm -hmm. uh and so i'm just more and become more and more interested in learning more about anything about the eyes because you know from a chinese medical medical perspective and a lot of philosophies the eyes are the the door to the soul and I think that that's true from a mental health point mm -hmm. of view. And so I was like, oh, well, here's an expert. I should go listen to him because I'm sure he has lots of information that I don't have. So thank you very yeah. much for your presentation. You're welcome. Likewise, I, I'm aware of uh, TBI, traumatic brain injury, and just the sensory overload phenomenon, but multi-sensory as well. And certainly topics like EMDR, eye movement desensitization is a factor. Uh, to maybe work with trauma issues. I'm not trained in that particular modality, but there's variations between left hemisphere and right hemisphere that can be cross-referenced sure. that, that can help integrate uh, processes that way. So great. So that's more of a holistic vision that you've got. Mm -hmm. I, I'm here for whatever information you can share because like, right. I, I, you know, like I'm a jack of all trades and mas mm -hmm. master of, of, physiology, I would say, but not eyes for sure. Okay. All right. Thank you. 
Well, great. Does anyone, thank you so much, Kristen. Thank you. Um, anybody have uh, relationships where I think the flyer had referenced something about balance and uh, feeling steady on your feet, uh, equilibrium. Um, what was that factor all about? If I go to my email, for many of us, eyes play an enormous role in experiencing the world, but they might be doing more than you think. So this experiential workshop, looking at how to help to coordinate movement, balance, equilibrium, even the emotional state, how to support your eyes, effective thinking, quality of being. How about just you know getting around in the world on your feet? Anybody who, balance and vertigo, Wanda references, Wanda references balance and vertigo in the chat on, on her device. Okay, so I think we'll be able to play all that together, certainly, yeah? All right. Well, let's get started with just thinking about how, I'm gonna take my eyeglasses off too to reference things. And I have some, some notes, you know, I'm a bit nearsighted, but you know, there's this idea of expression in the eyes where maybe again, we can reference someone with cognitive challenge uh, and that can happen to any of us in any state of time with so much to multitask. But you know, it, let's say you, you were involved in multitasking and there was like many things to have to solve in the moment, maybe an urgent and important situation that required a very necessary solution to be effective. And you were tired at the same time, it was 3, 8, 3 a.m. or something, and your eyes are half open, half closed. Could all of you do that now uh, in your virtual worlds here? Just have your eyes be half open, half closed, like it was um, middle of the night after a fatiguing week or something and a culminating situation occurred that you had to think fast on your feet, but you were tired. Have your eyes half open, half closed, and you've got three options in front of you. Somebody's offering more options to you. And just say something like, I'm trying to think. Just say that verbally in yourself or even sub-vocally. I'm trying to think. And just feel how alert are you with your eyes half open, half closed and trying to think, you know. It's the, the trying, I, I think about Yoda, you know, uh, there is no try, only do, which I tell my kids a lot, right? And of course Yoda had big eyes, right? Big wide eyes, Yoda, so you didn't have to try anything. You probably just had presence of uh, the force and an optimal relationship to everything else in the, the, uh, the, the galaxies, right? So there's an idea of how our eyes can affect our thinking, just, you know, how bright our is the presence through our eyes. And certainly fatigue and cognitive fatigue contributes to that. Uh, there could be a discovery where someone discovers a great solution, says, I've got it. And the eyes are bright and wide. You can hold up the finger and say, yes, I've got it. And your eyes are big, right? And there's an emotional quality of excitement with the eyes radiating openness and um, discovery, right? Compared to say, if your eyes are half open, half closed, Go ahead, rephrase the same uh, context of I've got it. You know, is it really exciting so much? You know, is it really enlivening so much? If your eyes are half open, half closed, uh, it doesn't feel the same impact internally uh, of enthusiasm or excitement when we're sluggish with our eyes, right? And I, I've heard about a commercial on the radio, one of the stations, I think KEXP, uh, I think the zoo up in um, Seattle, Woodland Park Zoo, is it, right? I guess there's some kind of a um, bug's eye view, kind of uh, interactive uh, media program called Bug's Eye View. Think about insects with the shapes of their eyes in nature and how you go to catch a fly and it gets away if you detect something and motion coming toward it that survives. And yet there's something about us humans being biped and upright where our ability to turn around the central axis is more available to see the world around us or detect the world around us in a 360 degree way than any other four-legged organism or maybe even winged organism, though the rounded eyes uh, is, is other thing to speculate about. So let's look at maybe starting an experiment where we're gonna be doing a couple of things, standing and sitting 
it'd be nice if we could lay on the floor and compare right and left, but it's not so practical on the Zoom format compared to say a live workshop where we would have like a, a retreat center floor space to anti-gravitize ourselves from standing and sitting. But we can mimic uh, laying on our side by just tilting to the right or tilting to the left, which I'll guide you toward uh, futuristically here. So wherever you are in your worlds out there, could you stand on your feet, please? Just come to standing on your feet someplace in front of your device. So you're all standing, I presume. And while you're there standing, imagine the walls around you and the device in front of you no longer exist. You have infinite space as far as your eye can see. There's some delineation, maybe far in the distance. We'll call it a horizon. And that horizon could be uh, a coastline. It could be uh, the flat plains of, say, Kansas or um, flat lands, yeah, Indiana, somewhere like this. It could be the horizon of the moon, just some kind of horizon. And if there's a boat or a ship or a spacecraft in the center of the horizon, sense some reference at the far end of the horizon, far vision. Yeah? It's visible in detail enough to know that it is something, a ship or a starship or a boat or maybe a, a farm tractor, something. And go ahead and navigate with your eyes to the right and just see how far the horizon extends to the right of you. And then come back to center. And then with your eyes only, not really turning your head, just navigate your eyes leftwardly to see how far the horizon is accessible to the left. And notice right away, is there a bias to one direction based on either your, your preconditioning or uh, genetic, genetic propensity or both? And now that's kind of a far vision. Now suppose there was maybe a circular planetarium around you where that horizon was just a bit closer and more spherical from the inside, like a lot of planetarium museums tend to be. And I, I recall a time in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico where something about being close to the equator the horizon of the ocean looked rounder to me from one of these um, pyramid, um, Aztec, um, Inca, uh, yeah, Aztec type pyramids, or Mayan, I'm sorry, Mayan type pyramids from the viewpoint up top. It was just kind of uh, a circular contoured view that was around me. So whatever works for you, go ahead and let your eyes scan that, but this time include your head. Your eyes and head can orient to the right to see the contours of the planetarium or inner sphere or circularity of say the earth sphere and then orient leftwardly as well. If you're watching me on the screen, I might be the opposite mirror image of what I'm saying. So you're better off having your eyes closed maybe. And again, notice if there's a, a, a sense of direction that seems more available to you. And now that's visualizing the world around you. And now visualize yourself in the world too. Sense, say, the length stance of both legs under you. There's an alignment of your right leg from the hip down to your footprint, your left leg down from your footprint. And now notice the length of each leg. And how about the size of your torso? Does one side of yourself feel maybe shortened compared to the opposite side if you carried a briefcase uh, for quite some time or maybe you're oriented over a mouse device and putting things a certain dominance maybe one side of you feels longer compared to shorter just notice the ground under your feet i presume you're standing on level ground in your rooms where you are and now suppose you're out on a summer hike in the Cascades or Olympic Mountains, and now you're standing on a slope vista where 
the trail is uphill to the left and downhill to the right. And so your left side is be sort of maybe behaving shorter to accommodate the upslope. Your right side might be accommodating longer to reach and support the downslope. And now just feel your horizon. Where is it now with your eyes? If your eyes track right, does it feel shorter or longer on the downhill side compared to tracking left? If it was a windy day or a slippery slope, it was foggy uh, visual context. Do you feel more secure to one side versus the other? And where is your balance point? Is it slightly left or slightly right of where you think your middle is or is it the middle? Or is the middle neutral skewed to one direction? And now suppose the weather cleared in front of you, you're standing still uphill left, downhill right on the trail, looking on the vista, and you see a mountain slope that is maybe parallel the same direction, um, downhill right, uphill left. But then beyond that, there's other mountain ridge that is downhill on the left and uphill on the right. If you track that slope, it's opposite of how you're standing. Just notice now, find a midpoint on the slope that's opposite direction in the distance. And now track your eyes left and right and feel if that feels a bit disconcerting. Yeah. And I'll come back to a regular horizon. You're standing on a platform and just maybe pause a moment there. Some of that might feel dizzy already, and so if it's too much, you can always downgrade your slope if you need to. And now go ahead and maybe suppose you're returning um, on the trail, you're facing the other direction on a ridge. Maybe now the uphill is on the right, the downhill is on the left. And so I now visualize that the right side feels maybe elevated, left side feels maybe lengthened, perhaps the right side shortened a bit. And now orient your head on the natural horizon that you would expect on the a horizontal environment. And maybe orient your head and eyes one direction might feel downhill. Maybe that feels shorter. Maybe uphill feels longer. Of course, these are your front eyes, yeah? But now, see, now suppose you were a different uh, organism from another planetary system where you had eyes in the back of your head. So now maybe as you orient to look up and right with your earthly eyes in front of you, the eyes behind you are looking downhill, perhaps the left eye more than the right one. And then as you have your head look downhill, by reference of your front eyes, maybe the back right eye is looking uphill. And now pause in the middle, find a balance point between these two. And now how discernible is, say, a natural horizon? So you can compare horizon. Kathy Ross, you just entered the waiting area and you're here. She's connecting the audio. We'll catch her up when she's on. So right now, just pause. Pause in neutral, whatever that is anymore. Be on level ground standing. And now just orient, we're standing doing an experiment, just orient turning to the right now with your eyes and head and see how far away the horizon feels after these, these mental shifts we were doing on imaginary slopes. Then come back to starting point, we're standing on our feet, comparing right and left. And now have your head and eyes orient leftward and just sense the horizon in front of you and how far does it extend to left or right of you, okay? So that's a standing experiment. And the horizon and maybe a varied horizon. And I'd like to kind of backtrack and talk about something with regard to how our vision navigates, not just our external environment, but also our, our sense of self. And the reference here is that um, there's something about our eyes more than seeing around us. But the idea that our eyes direct our attention 
but our attention also directs our eyes. And when it comes to situations involving stress or anxiety or maybe a traumatic event, there's something about eyes that can become very fixated. And I myself had like a, a painful hip from my trauma, a rollerblade injury that accelerated some degenerative arthritis um, and I needed a hip replacement. But I noticed that the confinement of restricted movement in my femur, the ball and socket of my hip is spherical as well. So about my eyes kind of fixated there to say, ah, there's that stiffness again. How can I get it unstiff while looking at it or being drawn toward it? Am I okay? Be careful, this doesn't, you know, there's a way that pain has in our body that confines our attention and kind of fixates that region. Maybe some of you have an experience like that. And our periphery feels less available too under those conditions that we're vulnerable to maybe an outside aggression that might happen. Our limbic system, our emotional system implicitly knows that. And maybe with like, again, traumatic brain injury, everything amplified, difficulty discerning and differentiating what's relevant, what's not, can maybe just be a withdraw of the eyes. They're just kind of glaze and say, I'll just kind of uh, wait and be receptive this way in a passive way, you know? So it's a very interesting situation. And so, you know, a lot of the advent of things like augmented reality and virtual reality certainly play with our vision as well. What I'd like to do now is look at the idea of outside of the horizon or different slopes of horizons is ask you to maybe visualize a skeleton in its entirety somehow. Now, many of you have maybe gone to uh, in Seattle on up, up Madison or uh, on top of uh, Queen Anne Hill, there's these radio towers that are kind of white on top, kind of red on the bottom. They're like, you know, from the 70s or something. Um, lattice work, metallic structures that crisscross their engineering beams to support a verticality. In many ways, our skeleton is that kind of thing too. So just take a look and I'd like you to just kind of visualize a skeleton in a room, maybe this one, and just visualize head to feet, a continuity of the skeleton. Let's kind of oscillate the verticality of the skeleton this is a new motor skill for me to do on Zoom. But there's the lens. Okay, so a verticality of the skeleton, like Superman. <laughs> and then a verticality down. And just feel and sense that you're seeing a continuity of a, of a, of a structure that is really one integrated function in lots of ways, yeah? Okay, so everybody has a sense of feeling and sensing continuity of something, right? I'll keep it in constant motion. But now what I'd like to ask you to do is perhaps in your own life or someone you know, somebody has maybe a, a stress barometer or a pain barometer area that gets fixated. Could be an area of pain, some spot in the back, some spot in the hip, neck, stress tension, shoulder. Pick one spot that dominates your experience or someone else you know's experience that they can touch someplace on themselves with their hand or finger says it hurts here or I feel stress here or somewhere, yeah? Find a barrier that you know or someone else knows, just one area in the body that you'd recognize or someone else would recognize, yeah? And so have that in the back of your mind. And now I'll ice send the skeleton again and you'll notice I'm going constant speed, but notice the spot you picked might be a quality of eye movement or tracking that feels in some way, at some point, relatively stuck compared to the rest of the continuity. Interesting phenomenon, yeah? One more time. Notice that that feels more amplified, that particular region, than anywhere else along the continuity of the skeleton. Yeah.
And this quality of slow movement gives you a chance to discern. And when we learn new movements, which we'll be doing shortly, that quality of methodical slowness to perceive is what we'll be doing. So any, any I see there's a chatter. Any, any comments about uh, anything that might have been uh, relevant about your experience of seeing the continuity of the skeleton versus the interruption of the skeleton? Did anybody experience the phenomenon I was talking about on the screen? Because it's the first time I've, do it, I've done it on the screen. I do it in my office. Yeah. OK. Elizabeth has a heart showing there. Yeah, OK. All right. So just the idea that our eyes can really confine our experience, and then the confined experience maybe confines our eyes, vice versa. But maybe the eyes aren't just, again, for seeing, but perceiving our world internally, externally. You stood, you've compared left and right. Um, I'd like to now just show you how the body could confine the eyes another way. So go ahead and stand up on your feet again, or were you already standing? If you were standing, go ahead and sit. If you were sitting, go ahead and stand. We can do it either way, this way. Whatever your preference is, you can choose to sit. But if you do sit, sit on the front edge of your chair, <clears throat> like the front third of your chair, so that if you moved a couple inches forward, you'd be sitting off your chair. <clears throat> have your right hand on your right knee, left hand on left knee. And in a very subtle way, because you slowly but surely contract the right side of your rib cage. <clears throat> Excuse me. Contract the right side of your rib cage like you were cringing. Maybe a scene in a movie, or just maybe uh, an order in a room or maybe an, um, somebody yelling on the street uh, behind your backyard or something. It's interesting how visual, auditory, or even the thud of something, you know, the sound of something <clears throat> can create a visual cringe. And maybe you can almost see your ribs cringing together on the right side. <clears throat> now cringe one more time, but do half of what you did. Just cringe about half of what you did. Maybe on the threshold, of a full cringe, at the threshold of the start of a cringe. And now while that's cringing, add to that, just tighten your right buttock underneath your right seat. <coughs> or if you're standing, tighten your right buttock underneath your right leg. <coughs> yes. <coughs> so you're doing first the ribs and then tightening the right buttock. <coughs> and notice as you do these two things, do these with your eyes closed. Thus, where do your eyes go? Do they tend to track in the direction of where you're cringing or contracting <coughs> or opposite? Let your eyes respond however they will. Let that go, set or stand neutral. <coughs> <coughs> And now, go ahead and invoke your right ribs, <clears throat> invoke your right buttock, and add to this, pressing your right heel <clears throat> into the ground. So you have the three things. And now with your eyes, the trajectory of your eyes, where does that go? It's slightly downward than before because your heel's involved. And so we'll go ahead and call this a pattern, a very subtle pattern that's probably a component in the modern world of the mouse device to the right and gas pedal to the right, traffic and the brake to the right, right? Right, no pun intended, correct. <laughs> So invoke this pattern, we'll call it the pattern. One, the rib cage, two, the buttock, three, the right heel. The eyes are kind of permeable to all that. And now if you're sitting, maintain this subtle pattern and stand up. If you're standing, maintaining the subtle pattern, sit down, but maintain the subtle pattern. 
He says, how easy is it to stand up over here, right leg or sit down with this pattern being subtly exaggerated? Would this be a sciatica symptom? Would it be a low back symptom? Would it be a, a neck sprain symptom or a shoulder sprain symptom? It's really not an isolated muscle, contrary to popular physical therapy. It's not an isolated muscle. The brain doesn't think muscles in everyday action. It's a component of synergy, in this case, a bias towards side bending right and how the eyes get drawn that way, a tonic neck. And now go ahead and find something that's within your grasp with your hand, a pencil, a mouse, uh, a container, a can, an object, and just feel what it's like to grasp the object. Or if you had to shake hands with someone next to you, what would the quality of the handshake be like if they shook the hand of an imaginary person? Yeah. How would they perceive you? Yeah. And I'll come back and I'll just um, go ahead and uh, sit. Everybody is set for now. Let go of that pattern. And now while you're sitting, just let your eyes and vision track the horizon to the right of you. Turn your head to the right, your eyes to the right, and track the visual. Is it a visual world or a perceptual world? By that I mean, is it just the eyes? But just track, track the world to the right of you and just sense your, if it was a windy day, would you feel the wind on your right cheekbone as you turn that way? Yeah. And then come back to middle, pause in middle, neutral, yeah. And now begin to track your environment to the left of you. And notice maybe that access of the world to the left of you, the barrier might not seem quite as available after exaggerating one side of the body, yeah? It's like the brain is hemisphere left, hemisphere right. We augmented experience to one side. That's sort of a key trick we play with in the Feldenkrais method, which is a, a neuroplastic basis for changing habits and behaviors, yeah. But you might notice that the left feels a bit more of a barrier, yeah? More than likely, perhaps. So we could just shorten the left side of cage and do all this kind of stuff. But instead, let's play something with about transmigration of eyes. So now while you're sitting here, imagine you take your left eyeball out of your eye socket. Don't really do it, just imagination, OK? <laughs> Unless you can, it'd be headlines, right? But <laughs> we are making a headline around our head, potentially. But imagine taking your left eyeball out of your eye socket and placing it in your left ear, OK? And maybe use your hand to touch yourself too. Frame your fingertips around, say, your closed eyelid, spare, half of the sphere, and gather the spare in a gentle way, pluck the left eyeball out, stick it in your left ear, plant it in your left ear, in the ear hole, right? This leaves your left eye socket as a vacancy, yeah? A bit disconcerting. So let your right eyeball be taken with your right hand out of your right eye socket and plant, transplant <laughs> the right eyeball into your left eyeball's socket, yeah? This is a virtual reality kind of idea anyway. Yeah. And just doing that, just reference the left side of your world, just sitting there doing nothing. If the imagination is clear enough, you know, something feels different on your left side. Your left eye is your left ear, your left eye socket is now your right eye, but it's left, at left eye socket. And I'll go ahead, venture the world to the left of you now. You see your left eye sees behind you out your left ear, yeah? And see that maybe you see a bit more available that way just by transplanting where your uh, references for vision may not be your anatomical eye, but we see everywhere. There are experiments, uh, Bakarita is the name, if you pick up a book called uh, The Brain's Way of Healing, and the brain that changes itself, both by Norman Deutsch, D-O-I-D-G-E. There's a reference made to a uh, neuroscience researcher named, I think, Paul Bakarita. His wife was a Feldenkrais uh, assistant trainer in Eugene when I was training there, Oregon. Um, and But there were visual experiences he did where persons who were congenitally blind could not see vision through their eyes 
they can project images on the skin of their back, like infrared heat images that were hotter in some spots than others in such a way that it formed uh, um, an image of hot spots that were aggregated together to be like a tree or an animal or uh, a toy car or something. But the persons could see the image on the skin of their back and the MRI or the CT scan, the PET scan, what would, would resonate to demonstrate blood flow, metabolic activity at the visual cortex at the back of the brain, even though it was not through the eyes proper, yeah? So our vision is potentially everywhere, is the idea. So now, let's go ahead and get in touch with our vision another way. And what I'll do is I can invite you now to... Um, to maybe uh, sit back um, and just rest in the back of your backrest of your chair for a moment. Just take a, take a, a punctuation break here for a moment. And the remainder of this session, we're gonna have our eyes mostly closed. And we're gonna see about the dexterity and acuity of sensing our actual eyes, but then transmigrating them to maybe witness how our horizon can be more expanded, yeah? So I'll come to the front edge of your seat. So you're not in the back of the chair or the front of the chair, but maybe the front third of the chair. You're perched on the ledge, but you're not worried about falling off the edge. At the same time, you're free to move. And if you have armrests, your elbows are kind of in front of your armrests of your chair, yeah? And now with both eyes closed, if you wear glasses, you have to raise your eyeglasses up like a movie star, yeah, on your forehead. I'll keep mine on though, because I got some visual things I got to attend to. <laughs> All right. So with your eyes closed, raise your right hand in front of your field of vision with your index finger elevated. Like you're about to sort of make a point with your index finger uh, during a lecture or a classroom or a debate much like a politician or a professional debate person might do, yeah. But instead of admonishing or critiquing something outside you, let your fingertip be soft. And if it helps, you can imagine your eyeball could be your fingertip, a fingertip on your eyeball or an eyeball on your fingertip, yeah. And go ahead and let the eyeball on your fingertip have a closed eye as well. So the eyelid on your index finger's tip is also a closed eye. It's pretty bizarre, man. Like Pink Floyd music would help, right? So, <laughs> but okay. So anyway, this is a way to have some eye identity for your, where your right eye might be. With your right eye closed, let your right index fingertip, the pad of your fingertip, approach your closed eyelid as if to eventually, but not quite, contact the center of your right eye, the pupil in the center of the iris. But don't touch your eyelid quite yet. Just Get the vicinity, the approximation as to where the center of your right index finger's pad would be the bullseye of the fingertip, matching, mimicking the eyeball bullseye center of your right eye. And then withdraw your fingertip away a few inches or inch or so. And let's go back and forth that way and you're on the threshold of contact in your eyelid, but just not quite. And as your right index finger pad approaches your right eyeball, can you sense an anticipation of them meeting each other? And is that line of anticipation accurate? Would it indeed be the center of your eye? Or would it be your cheekbone or your eyebrow? or some other part of your upper or lower eyelid. Just reference your tracking and then go ahead and allow your contact to be made. Your eyelid and it's like touchdown, like a spacecraft on the moon touched down and landed softly on new soil. So your finger tip pad is subtly, softly contacting the front of your right eye. Those of you who are contact lens wearers may have some advantage with this, who knows? I myself am not, but... And just withdraw your fingertip from your eye again, and it's get a sense that, yeah, that is your right eye, yeah? 
and let your hand rest on your lap, your right hand. And just notice, just after touching your right eye, does that side feel more broad-eyed or augmented compared to your left one just now? Even the reference marks between the right side of your face, your corner of your eye, your nostril, the corner of your lip, maybe something there is highlighted, even though it wasn't touched. Your right visual field might be your right facial field. Yeah. And now go ahead and compare the left side. Bring your left index finger in the front of your field of, um, I guess, view in front of your eye is still closed. And very softly let the fingertip of your left index finger, the pad, approach, proximate the center of your left eye. So you're bringing your left index finger toward your left eye. Your left eye is closed. And stop just before you touch your eye at some point. That can be one inch, two inch, three inch, quarter inch. And then withdraw the finger away again. It's interesting to think, are the eyes being stable to interact and meet? Does the left eye slightly converge toward the nose bridge or slightly diverge? Some of us might have a, a I don't want to say a lazy eye, but maybe a slight deviation bias outer periphery versus inward focus. And so the developmental optometrist uh, assess us quite well. I, I know by Federal Way, Curtis Backstrom is a vision development center that does some of this work. And then when you feel like you've got a sense of where the center of your eye might be relative to the center of your index fingertip, go ahead and contact your left closed eye and see if it feels more on target or off target on this left side. And then go ahead and withdraw that and let your left hand just rest on your left knee. If you want to take a visual break from having eyes closed, you can open your eyes for a moment if you'd like or maintain your eyes softly closed either way. And now, could you this time close both eyes again? And notice as you're, as you're tracking your, your index finger contact with your eye, there's some sort of visualization, either like an outside person you as watching from an outside perspective, or an inside person also you as watching from an inside perspective. Just an interesting phenomenon of where vision happens can be anywhere. Yeah? So now this time, bring your index finger to the outside corner of your right eye, kind of along where the eyelashes would meet the convergence of upper eyelash to lower eyelash, the right outside corner of your right eye. And at this point, the eye softly closed. Transform your contact from pad of right index finger to fingertip, maybe the tip of a nail, yeah? The nail's not sharp or anything, just a light contact, more of a delineation, like instead of a thick marker, it's like a thinner pencil or pen tip, yeah? More of a fine point, but not a point, just a line, a delineator, yeah? And I'll begin to trace this index finger uh, nail tip back backward along your temple, maybe above your cheekbone, Maybe it might approach the top of your right ear or maybe the, uh, uh, the, the ear hole, but probably maybe above your ear where your eyeglasses would rest if you wore sunglasses or something. Begin to trace that line behind your ear along the latitude of your back of your skull, the side of your skull, back of your skull, and begin to stop at a point where you think your right eye behind your head would exist as a mirror image representation relative to your front right eye. So like the kindergarten teacher or the, the mom of newborns or toddlers has eyes in the back of their head, this is your chance to practice that, yeah? And notice um, when you arrive there, it's the corresponding projection. If your right eyeball turned completely around itself and looked behind itself, 
the center of your eyeball would see the center of your fingertip, yeah? And then migrate your fingertip back, back to where you began and see with your eyes closed, can you trace that trail back reversibility-wise to arrive back at the corner of your right eye without opening your eyes, just trace it back. And notice, do you land exactly at the right corner of your eye? Or is it your eyebrow slightly above or your cheekbone slightly below? And now do this a number of times. It's like if a spherical equator is on the surface of the earth, you're tracing the line of the equator. Above your line is the upper hemisphere of your skull. Below the line is the lower hemisphere of your skull. I just kind of trace that while looking straight ahead. Yeah. And when you get to the back of your skull where the right eyeball is behind your skull, just pause there and reference that relative to your front right eye. And then come back again. Good. And I'll just pause, rest your right arm. By the way, if you have a shoulder condition or elbow condition that prohibits you from having your arm that long, just feel free to step out of that and imagine it. <coughs> <clears throat> and now just sense the, the world to the right of you now, after tracing yourself. <clears throat> and now go ahead and do the same thing with your left hand. Bring your left hand to your left front of your eye. And then, and then go ahead and transform that fingertip into the nail bed or the nail tip part of your left index finger at the corner of your left eye and begin to trace a line from the back of your left eye <coughs> uh, through the temple toward the back of your, toward the top of your left ear, maybe above your left ear, depends on your ear shape, <coughs> and then behind your left ear along the latitude, and begin to find the rear left eye there. And again, sense how well does this left eye, the rear eye behind your skull, line up with the front eye in front of you. If the left eye were to turn and look back behind itself, would it see the left eyeball behind your skull through the center of the pupil seeing your fingertip? Then come back forward again, trace the trajectory backward and forward. I guess backward is forward again to let your fingertip arrive very slowly at the corner of your left eye. And again, do you, do you mash the corner? Or, or do you, do you um, miss the target? And I'll pause a moment there. And now just go ahead and look at your horizon now though, from left to right, let your head turn left and right and visualize the horizon around you and feel after tracing a horizon on your skull, does that augment the sense of a horizon around you? Maybe there's less stops and starts as you orient your head left and right to see around you. And believe me, there's something like this helps people with neck problems feel looser in their neck much better than stretching their neck from a different perspective, you know? And I'll just pause in a moment, take a rest at your backrest in your chair. Let yourself rest in your backrest if not already. And now, this time, if you were laying on your back and hovering your finger in front of you, you could imagine your uh, fingers contacting your eye from a distance, letting your arm hang, say, laying on your back above you. Let, let both arms be horizontal for a moment in front of you while you're sitting back reclined. And let the index fingers kind of curl toward you, both of them. And go ahead and let both elbows bend and let both index fingers approach your eyeballs as if to feel where they might be. And notice if one hand feels swifter and smoother to arrive at one eye first, the right finger to the right eye or the left finger to the left eye. Now, whichever side feels easier, um, kind of abandon the other hand and work at the easy side first. 
So if it felt easier for your right finger to approach your right eyeball, do the right side. If it felt easier for your left finger to approach your left eyeball, do the left finger. So whichever dominant hand of ease is there, begin to let your index finger approach your eye. And as your, as your finger is approaching your eye, kind of lean forward and have your eye kind of meet your fingertip too. And to see where they could meet halfway. And then come back from there, maybe recline in the chair. And let the finger withdraw from your right eye again. And then again, you can bring your dominant curled index finger, curled elbow to meet your eye. And notice if you're if you lean forward too fast, it might inhibit. Or if you try to bend your elbow hard, it might inhibit. You're finding softness in a way to circumvent yourself here. Yeah. Where is the grace where they can meet halfway? Yeah. Or it might be three quarter way in your arm, one quarter way out your torso. Yeah. Let that rest. Rest your arm, whichever arm it was on your lap. And notice the height of your shoulder on that side relative to the other shoulder. One side might feel more relaxed or maybe cohesive. And if you shrug the shoulder on that side and drop it, maybe it just feels more at ease compared to the other side. So you've referenced eye-hand coordination in some ways here. And you're more in tune with both yourself and your environment, yeah? So whichever hand was not tracing um, the space in front of you to contact your eye, go ahead and bring the other uh, curled finger in front of that representative eye. So if it was your right hand, now it's your left hand. If it was your left hand, now it's your right hand. And again, curl the finger tip toward your left eyeball. And at a certain point, it's almost like reaching forward to kiss someone on a first date. You know, you don't want to be too abrupt. You don't want to be too shy. You sort of smooth it out. <laughs> Let your left eyeball kind of reach out to almost kiss and contact your finger. Uh, tip. They meet, they exchange, they withdraw from each other, <laughs> look into each other's eyes, <laughs> right? And then unfold, let the finger extend out in front of you again as you settle back, yeah. And then repeat again, yeah. The eye is approaching the finger, the finger is approaching the eye. Some proportionate relationship, they, they meet each other. And you might notice on this side, if it's less dominant, maybe you miss the eyeball, maybe you hit your nose bridge or your eyebrow or some, it doesn't, it's, it's okay. We're, we're doing this to sort of, nobody gets a bullseye without luck, right? Or pin the tail on the donkey or another perceptual visual environment of a donkey anatomy uh, for a birthday party. As soon as that first kiss is awkward, you know, it misses <laughs> the contact, right? And I'll just rest your left hand on, or whichever hand it was, on your lap. And just notice how that shoulder might have caught up a little bit. Yeah. You shrug that shoulder, you just worked with up and down and notice, wow, maybe something feels more relaxed through envisioning a relationship to yourself. Your present self, yeah. But I've got, I gave plenty of references to maybe past self too. <laughs> All right. And so if you're reclined in your chair, go ahead and sit forward again in the front edge of your chair. And now I'd like you to this time to imagine swiveling your knees to the left, like you're gonna get out of a car seat. Actually, no, let's let's come, let's, be, let's actually be a passenger in the car seat. You're on the passenger side of the car. So you're on the front edge of the chair, swivel your knees to the right, like you're getting out of the car, and you're looking out the car door halfway to the right. So your torso is relatively to the right. If, you're on, if you were laying on the floor, you could imagine laying on your right side. And now, go ahead and bring your left index finger to contact uh, the front of your left eye, closed eye. And again, begin to trace your um, fingertip to the corner of your eye. Let that corner of the eye transform your fingertip into maybe the nail, the tip of the finger, the nail part. And now trace that line to the center of your left ear. 
And when you get to the center of your left ear, the midpoint of your skull, not front, not back, but midpoint, your left index finger above your left ear, maybe the tip of your upper left ear, at that point, stay there. And what I can do now is drape your right arm around the outside of your face on the right side of your midsection of your skull in such a way that your finger trips drape like tentacles or octopus fingers over um, the top of your right ear where your left index finger is currently pointing. Yeah. So it's like you're, you're keeping a hand on on a windy day uh, with your, your forearm is covering the top of your head. Your elbow is bracketed above your right eye, but your fingertips are draped over your left ear as if to keep your hand on, yeah? And now while you're there, begin to trace your left index finger forward again toward the corner of your left eye. But as you do, turn your head to simultaneously have your eye meet your fingertip. So your face and skull are turning leftward as the left, eye, as the left index finger is approaching your eye. So your head is swiveling. It's like there's a windy day, you're keeping your hand on, but looking toward your left shoulder. And as you're looking toward your left shoulder, the approaching fingertip is approaching the corner of your left eye again. Yeah. And now pause in the middle. If you want to rest your right arm, you can drape it back on your lap again. Probably a good idea. So your index finger was tracing forward to the corner of your left eye. You're turned to the right still as if a passenger getting out of the um, passenger side of the car. Again, drape your right forearm over the top of your head. Your finger is dangling somewhere above your left ear. And now begin to trace the left index finger behind to find your left eye behind you. But notice it might feel kind of tricky to do, to reach behind with the index finger while you're turned to the right. So come back to the middle of your ear. Now notice the horizon in front of you. Is it that mountain trail where it's uphill on the left, downhill on the right? Or is it the mountain trail that's uphill on the right, downhill on the left? Or is it a perfect horizon? Or is it none of those? In any case, as you begin to turn your, as you begin to trace your fingertip toward the back of your skull to find the left eyeball behind your skull again, and the finger starts to feel tense, transform the index finger into the remaining four fingers that are not the index finger to feel that part. And now begin to trace the four fingers behind your head as you turn your face to the right. It's almost like shampooing your hair on that drowsy day, right? Turning the head. So your head is turning right while the fingertips are migrating toward the back of your skull. You'll notice it's not the index finger that's smoothest this time. Maybe the four other fingers. And if you can reach to the back of your skull, notice which finger feels most predominant to represent your left eyeball from behind. Is it the middle finger? Or maybe further, you can look at your baby finger or ring finger. And now if you switch to the index finger, it feels kind of awkward because it's not very habitual for us to point behind us with our index finger. So having the four fingers behind your skull, the rear left eyeball, begin to slide the fingers forward as you turn your face and head to the left. Stop at the midpoint, or above your left ear with your left fingers. And now switch the fingers over to be the index finger again and turn your face to the left as you approach your corner of your left eye. Good. And now rest both arms. Get back in the car seat. It wasn't the right stop. You decided to want to ride longer somewhere. Sit in your seat with knees forward now. And feel and notice the left side of yourself, the whole volume of the left side of yourself after orienting and tracing visionary references between hands and eyes. Yeah. Now your left shoulder might feel larger or elevated or something. Yeah. And while you're sitting here resting, hopefully in the back of the rest of your chair or some edge of your chair, comfortable facing forward, let yourself breathe and notice the volume in your left lung.
and then for a moment, compare the volume in your right lung. To breathe into your right side might feel less clear as well. So let's push you in the driver's seat this time. This time, swivel your knees to the left of you in such a way that you're sitting in your chair, that your right sit bone is closer to the front edge of your chair. Your left one is kind of scooted back in the chair. And now have your right index finger again, find your right eye, the center of your right eye. Begin to trace the fingertip toward the corner of your right eye. Transfer the pad of your finger to the fingertip, the nail bed part, tip of the nail. Again, as you trace your tip of your right index finger back toward the midpoint to the side of your skull, simultaneously turn your face to the left. and then stop there. So now your face is turned left, the same direction as your knees, maybe a little bit more. And your right index finger is above or near the top of your right ear. And now begin to trace that horizontal horizon line back, turning your head as you approach your finger toward the corner of your eye. So it's like a fingertip and the corner of the eye meet each other. And again, the departure, you turn your head away from your index finger as your index finger slides along the horizon. And, and then stop at your, um, above your right ear with your index finger again. And now this time, drape your left arm over the side of your skull so that your left elbow is more or less above your left eye. The forearm is resting on the top of your head. The fingers are draped over your right ear, or maybe your right hand over your right index finger, perhaps. And you're sort of looking at your left underarm with your sinus passage, I guess, yeah. OK. And now from here, begin to think about tracing the finger back as you turn your head to the left, as if to look at your crook of your left elbow. I feel there might be an interruption somewhere with that index finger behind. Come back to match the index finger above your right ear. And now transform, as you turn your face left and you trace your index finger back, shift your hand in such a way that the fingertips of the remaining fingers, everything but the index finger and thumb, are contacting the side of you. And you're, you're turning your face to the left as your index finger, I'm sorry, your middle finger, all the remaining four fingers, trace to the back of the eyeball on the back side of your skull this time the right side, the right skull eye. You're kind of poking yourself in the eye in a, a kind way to discern where you are, okay? And then begin to trace, as you trace your fingers forward again toward that midpoint of the side of your skull, turn your head to the right. Just outline yourself that way many times, a few times anyway. You trace to the back of your skull, and again, which, which finger test is most predominant? Is the middle finger, the ring finger? You could try the baby finger. The index finger, something different, you know? And then trace forward again, good. And now when you've reached above your ear with your fingers, transform, revert back to the index finger pointing. And now turn to find, turn your face to the right to have your index finger find the corner of your right eye the center of your right eye. And then when you reach the corner of your eye, transform back to the pad of the finger and let the, the, the pad of your right index finger just softly touch your right eye under your eyelid, yeah? And now let that rest. I just noticed the right visual field. What is a visual field? It's a visual system to the right of you. And now just to unify everything, you got, you, know, you can sit forward again. Uh, if you're getting out of the driver's seat on the driver's side, now just sit forward, both knees forward. We were simulating laying on your left side if we were on the floor. And now you're sitting at the front edge of your chair again and just notice your sense of self. And this time, bring both fingers and converge all five fingers together like you're holding a bead or a thimble or a marble and bring that to the inside corner of both eyes, the inside corner of both eyes, adjacent to your nose bridge. 
And now imagine an orbit, like rings of Saturn around the planet or, or a, a protoplasm of a cell wall around a nucleus, some kind of definable arc that's round around you, even an angel's halo. But let it be two halos. And let's just start with the right side first. Begin to withdraw your converged fingers forward in front of you and begin to trace an arc around your periphery of yourself, maybe a, a, a foot away or a couple of feet away, and arc that arc behind you like rings of Saturn to land this orbiter into your right rear eye behind your skull. And then from there, trace the reverse direction around the rings of Saturn, around the outside periphery of your head to again land on your um, an inside corner of your eye again, shall we say, yeah? And now, if you can leave your hand on your right eye, that's great. Bring your attention to your left fingers in the corner of your left eye and begin to uh, withdraw the fingertips away from your corner of your, inside corner of your left eye and begin to trace an arc out in front of you, almost like conducting an orchestra, in a broad orchestra, yeah? and follow that arc somewhere at shoulder level horizon behind you and begin to land this orbiter of fingertips converged in the back corner, the back side of your left eye, the back of your skull, your, your rear eye, the backward facing eye. And then from there, arc the loop forward again around this big arc, around the periphery of your horizon, back to the inside corner of your left eye and land there, good. And now with both hands together, go ahead and orbit uh, both sides coming forward in the world. And then you'll find an area where your hands just want to separate, containing your fingers as they are, arcing around either side of your uh, periphery of your horizon around you, behind you, and land both of these at your rear eyes, left converged fingers on left skull eye, right converged fingers and right rear skull eye, yeah? And just sense the world behind you. If you have binoculars that face backwards and you sort of looked around, you can just sort of see what's around behind you, yeah? And now one last time, bring the orbit in front of you, but go ahead and land at the center of each eyeball. So center of left eye, center of right eye, sense of center, and I'll just rest, slide your hands down your cheekbones, nose, lips, chin, your chest, sternum, unfold, rest on your lap there. And just to center yourself um, one other way, and we'll finish up here. But just notice you're sitting, and maybe the, the meditative space around you is almost timeless. So I, I think again too, if there was an intrusive stimulus somewhere from any direction around us, that perturbation of some intrusive unexpected stimulus, sure, we'd respond to it. But my senses and maybe your senses too, that that response or reaction would be attenuated somewhat, that maybe an entire nervous system is quieted from having uh, not just a visual, but a kinesthetic, spatial, maybe a multi-sensory reference of who we are and what's around us, such that we're less reactive and more proactive in some way. And so now just bring your hands flat and just kind of contour the sides of your head, the temples, like you were looking into maybe a hollow space, like a hole in a wall or something, yeah. And you feel both palms uh, facing each other, but they're in front of your cheekbones, yeah. Like you're looking into, um, you know, a passageway, yeah. And bring those parallel hands in front of each other. And now orient like you're holding a, a ball, a sphere, like a, a spherical object, and turn that sphere so the left hand goes under, the right hand goes above, almost like a Tai Chi move, and let that hover somewhere between your chest and your abdomen the right hand on top, left hand on bottom. I suppose your eyes could be closed still with this, but if you need the visual reference, 
you could open your eyes and see the screen if, if it's not clear, then close your eyes again. But now begin to rotate the sphere to your left. So it goes downhill on the left, uphill on under from the right. And maybe your ribs side bend to left on the left side a little bit, your ribs, right ribs open, yeah? Then rotate that sphere to where it feels balanced in front of you. It's almost like a, a pocket of energy or a sphere. It's not too tight compressed. It's not too open and diffused, but you feel the shape of it, yeah? And now rotate that sphere to the right in such a way that it feels like your right hand is going downhill and your underhand is going uphill. And maybe your ribs are side bending to the right. And maybe that shifts you onto your left sit bone if you're sitting or your left foot if you're standing. And go ahead and maybe, if you were sitting, go ahead and stand. If you were standing, go ahead and sit and do the same experiment in the other context. So now the ball sphere is in front of you. And just for variety, let's inverse our hands. Have the right hand on bottom, left hand on top this time. And now, if your right hand is on the bottom, left hand is on top, rotate the sphere to the right of you. And maybe if it's habitual or non-habitual, well, this arrangement might not feel as easy. Just go within the range of what's available. And then recenter it. If it feels impossible to go the other direction, inverse your hands again. So the right hand is again on top, left hand is on the bottom. The experiment, just see what works. And continue to rock the sphere, maybe left and right a little bit, feeling what happens under your seat or under your feet. And find a balance point where it doesn't feel tilted left or right. And at that point, set it aside and drop your arms by your sides. And whether you're sitting or standing, just come to standing now on your feet. You can let your eyes open. And just sense your room space around you. Even as I speak here, participating with you, my echo in my room feels more resonant. And is that me or is it the environment? Is it my perception of the environment? Just notice for yourself uh, the world around you. And now begin to sense your horizon to the right of you, and maybe shift to your right foot and turn and see the world behind you. Yeah. Then maybe sense the horizon to the left of you. Yeah. And now imagine those eyeballs behind your skull again. And let them see the horizon to the right of you from a rare perspective. Let the rear eyeballs see the horizon from a rear perspective behind you to the left. Yeah. I suppose if both front horizon and rear horizon became one, that would become a, 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 a plane or a line through the core of our inner air organs inside our ears, behind our eyes, in front of the back of our skull. Just feel the centerness there. And now just one last thing, look at the horizon left and right and imagine you're on an uphill slope, going up on the left, down on the right, on a trail. And now imagine the mountain that goes the opposite way. Tilt your head and follow the mountain that goes opposite way. So the slope is going uphill on the left, downhill on the right that you're standing on. Or in your head to look up and right to the mountain that's to the right of you, yeah? And I'll come back to the middle. And now tilt your slope the other way, downhill on the left, uphill on the right. So the slope is uphill on the right to you, downhill on the left on the trail. But the mountain ridge in the distance is uphill on the left and downhill on the right. Scan that diagonal horizon. Feel how secure you feel if you're on a snowboard or you know, slippery slope. And now pause in the middle and you can open your eyes and just sense the horizon around you now. And the quality of your chest, your breathing, and your presence. Yeah. Stand as long as you like, or sit as long as you like. 
We're basically done with the experiential part of this, which is the bulk of the thing. And I, I was thinking about an hour and a half. I don't know if we had an hour, an hour and a half, but we've done a lot. <laughs> so instead of instead of Tai Chi, this is I Chi. What we were doing with that spare was I Chi, variation of Tai Chi. Yeah. <laughs> That's a joke that just got thrown in. But uh, so when you're ready, if you'd like to open to the screen, in fact, looking at your screens. Just see the horizon of your screen. Or if you're seeing the horizon of a skeleton, just see if the flow of this feels less interrupted too. It's like a different, it's a Halloween shock in the box, slow motion. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Anyway, that's a patent I got for no, just kidding. There's no patent on it. Anyway. <laughs> All right. Um, all right, um, any questions or comments? Um, I see, thank you. I see this is fascinating. Yeah, it really is. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it, it really is. I, 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 love, I love this kind of stuff. It's just uh, surreal in lots of ways. And so um, part of what I'm working on in my, my next career move, I, I think the website got put up, uh, timsobi.com, alliantcare.com. Um, I'll be keeping clinic practice going, but probably more in line out in the world teaching. One interest area I have in developing is this area of virtual reality with these images, but an augmented reality where you're still in your real world, but images kind of guide you. And that's kind of in development right now with some of this stuff, especially for the inner air being uh, um, externalized, our deepest sense, yeah. Um, would anyone like to share any experiences they had about before and after or um, anything unusual? Uh, you can feel the free to chime in. Otherwise, you're going to respect our summer season and uh, enjoy the outdoors in the Northwest here. Don't see any comments. Well, this is Linda, and I was tired when I realized, oh, it's time to begin. <laughs> I joined you. Mm -hmm. um, and now I feel somewhat refreshed. Yeah. Like I'm ready to go outside. And I've been inside a lot today. Yeah. 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 I I um I feel refreshed too. I, I'm in that with you. <laughs> That's I'm I'm kind of doing work, but it wasn't really uh, you know, work, you know. It's entertainment in some ways. Um you know, as far as screen three, we are the screen. We are the projection surface of the uh, of the references that are visual and, and, and mobile. Yeah, thank you. And once again, I, Tim, I want to say how much I appreciate you putting us in a story because like mm -hmm. singing a song, this is easier to remember when we've we're doing it in yeah. a story, like on a walk or on a trail or something. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So it's functional and approachable. Uh, it's, it's got a context that makes it relivable in mm -hmm. daily life. So that's much different than say, okay, here's your home exercises for therapy. Okay, uh, here's the stick man exercises. Here's the neck rotation. Here's the hip rotation. Here's the eye movements. Here, do these three sets of 10, three times a day. You know, um, No, we don't really have time for that in life. But you have something that's, you go to turn, you think, goodness, I could arc myself to get into this um, cabinet or something, you know. Um, yeah, it becomes adaptable and generalizable. And I think the stories are really helpful. And part of what wants to happen is uh, these, these avatars, the skeleton is an avatar. Um, I think some avatars that represent organs or, or references can come into our field of view at a precise time when we need it to help augment the experience. So that's something to kind of look at too. Yeah. So yeah, I can appreciate story and reference and context. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Let me go back to view uh, full screen. Yeah. Okay. Well, this will be recorded and available, I guess, on the uh, Marlene's YouTube website. Is that right, Elizabeth? Yes, you can find it right now on our Facebook Tacoma page. So if you have any 
friends, family, loved ones that couldn't be here tonight to um, in, embrace that amazing um, uh, activity that we just all did together. Um, so you can hop on there and then it will be on our YouTube channel later this week. Great, great. Well, I want to thank you, Elizabeth, for coordinating everything um, and, and your uh, um, role. And the role being not just, well, in Marley's Market in Delhi, which is a great community resource for uh, um, products and information and uh, lifestyle that uh, we all need, right? Uh, the wellness and, um, uh, you know, variety and choice and, um, supplementation that we, we don't get in regular life. Um, and in some ways, this is uh, not a nutraceutical, uh, but it's sort of a perceptual ceutical or something. Yeah. It's perceptual medicine in some ways. Yeah. Perceptual medicine. I love that. That's very, um, uh, that's, yeah, because it is all about perception. And um, we're just very grateful for um, wonderful presenters like you who are in the mm -hmm. community making a difference and you know um, this this hour and a half um, you donating your expertise and time you oh, know yeah. mm -hmm. could really help change someone's uh, world and 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 their health mm -hmm. and for them to feel that they can take charge of their health so thank you very much Dr. So thank you so much so well and enjoy your summer everyone um, you'll see more of your summer this time though. I think you'll see it from lots of places. Yeah. So <laughs> good to know. All right. We'll sign off then. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you all for taking time.